Um, I'm Troy, if people don't know me, I'm the chair of the Queensland New South Wales branch and with support from the National IHHC Board um, and the Queensland um, Committee, we are the ones that have decided this, um, these series of workshops are going to be a good um, introduction to everybody about what ITSI is. Um, we have a live question for the end of the year. And um, we, we have, we're so lucky to have Julie on board. And Julie, one of the international coaches, does live in Brisbane. So, um, in the same time as myself, with men who plan the workshop, the webinars that are going to be presented um, between now and November. So, I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Um, and then if we do have any questions, we'll save them to the end and hopefully we have some time at the end. Um, we will try and wrap up um, by, uh, what time are you finishing, Julie? Is it 2.15 or 2.30? Um, I can extend it through to, to 2.30 if that's needed, so okay. that's, that's not a problem. Yeah. Okay, I'll hand it over to Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Troy, as well. All right, what I'm going to do just to start with is to um, to mute so that we've got a, everyone should be able to hear me okay. All right, um, I'd, all, I'd like to thank Troy and the IHHC for the opportunity um, to present. I'm uh, looking forward to this series of webinars. So thank you, Troy, for um, facilitating that. So this is our first webinar looking at a, an introduction and overview of the IDSI framework and our implementation in Australia. So um, most of you would probably be aware that IDSI, um, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative, uh, was published online in November 2015. Um, there is also information about the development of the framework that is um, free for open access from the Dysphagia Journal. In summary, the framework is a global standardised framework that provides both terminology and also definitions for texture modified foods and thickened liquids. We have it on a continuum of eight levels from 0 to 7. It's a colour coded model, um, recognising that for some people um, colours are easier to understand than words. It's culturally neutral in terminology and it includes descriptors, testing methods, and also evidence for both the drink thickness and the food texture levels. Um, you'll see that there is a, an overlap zone here um, at level three and level four. That is merely to indicate that those textures behave in the same way. Um, not that they, uh, not that if you're prescribed to liquidize that you must automatically have a moderately thick or, or uh, vice versa. We'll um, spend over the course of the next few webinars, we'll go through um, each of the levels in detail, but today is more about an overview uh, and an indication of how IDSI's come to Australia. So we have Australia uh, professionals, uh, professional associations who have formally endorsed and adopted. Um, so you can see the Dietitians Association of Australia, Speech Pathology Australia, and of course, um, the Institute of Hospitality in Healthcare as well. The, as far as the evolution of IDSI in Australia was concerned, um, we have our current national standards that were published in 2007. And then in um, late 2015, the IDSI board contacted um, key professional associations to alert them to the new international framework. Following on from that, there was a national stakeholder forum held in uh, December of 2016. And then there was endorsement by the Speech Pathology Australia and DAA boards in 2016, after which time a steering committee formed. Um, the steering committee has been meeting regularly on a, a monthly basis and we have representatives from DAA, um, Speech Pathology Australia, IHHC and also from industry. So we have Nestle Health Science, um, Trisco and also Flavor Creations. Um, the project officer, myself, um, I was appointed in um, May of this year and we are looking to adopt the IDSI framework on the 1st of May 2019. So why are we changing? This is a question that's um, quite often asked, you know, the, the if it's not broken, why fix it kind of question. Um, the Australian standards, as I mentioned, were published in 2007. So as such, they're actually more than 10 years old now. They were at the time based um, on the best available evidence. And in that um, 
intervening 10 years, we've had more evidence that's come to light. So the Australian standards were, um, were due for um, review at this point in time anyway. In 2012, uh, Australian clinicians, we had a review of the uptake of the Australian standards um, that was published and in that there was already some um, revisions that were suggested that were needed. So the ability to classify thickened liquids that would flow through an infant teat was something that was identified as needed by Australian clinicians. So this is one of the things that has in fact been addressed by the ITSI framework. The other thing that, um, that IDSI brings is objective measurement um, and this increases patient safety as a result of that. So what are these objective measures? Um, it allows us to, you know, those questions, well, how thick is thick or how soft is soft, how small is small? What we've done is uh, we've chosen um, measuring uh, methods that are going to be available at the person's bedside and that was something that was pressed home to us by um, people from the, um, the NHS who have unfortunately seen many um, coronial inquiries there. So it's something that can be something simple, something quick, something portable but importantly that it's reliable. It's possible to perform those tests every time but you actually won't need to do it every time. The tests are most useful for initial staff training if you're doing auditing of foods or drinks for industry to use and to develop and test their products and for kitchens to use um, to develop and test recipes as well. So over the, the coming webinars we'll go into each of those objective um, measurements in more detail. The other thing that IDSI brings is a, a real focus on safety. So um, I think we've looked at, at thickened fluids um, for, for many years and I think most people in this phase are well aware of um, that side of things. But there's also um, the choking side of things. So we have um, information that shows us the incidence of choking is nearly seven times higher in people over the age of 65 than it is in children aged one to four years of age. So we know that there's a lot of um, educational material around, um, particularly in regards to choking risk for young children, um, but it, it's probably less clear, um, less well known that that choking risk increases again as we get older. We also have some um, further support for the um, introduction and, and implementation of IDSI. Um, from the 2017 recommendations for prevention of injury related deaths in residential aged care services. Recommendation 20 there was that a suitably qualified Australian National Steering Committee develop guidelines for uh, providing residents with modified texture diets specifically designed to be implemented in Australian residential aged care facilities to align with the International Dysphagia Diet Standardisation Initiative. So in terms of um, Australian adoption of IDSI, we have, um, we've adopted the IDSI recommended doing this in a staggered and, and staged process as an aware, prepare, adopt uh, model. Um, and that's what Australia has chosen to do in the, um, the steering committee. So we began our awareness in 2016, 1st of December 2016, and then on the 1st of January this year we rolled over into the prepare phase. What, what we're doing at the moment is looking at protocols or processes that might need to change, looking at preparing materials, um, different inventories, computer management and training of all staff and stakeholders, looking really uh, carefully at anything that might need to change that ITSI will affect. So what's going to, ch to change? That's probably the big question I think that people want to know. So as we map from um, to liquids, for example, we've got the Australian um, standards on the, the and New Zealand standards on the left hand side and probably the first thing you'll see is that we've got new numbers. So we move from our 150, 400 and 900 to a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 level as far as the drinks are concerned. We also have different colours um, and I, I know it would be wonderful if we could keep the same colours. Um, there are a couple of reasons why they've changed. So first of all, it is an international standard which means that everyone around the world um, is coming to a, a unique um, set of colours rather than aligning with one particular um, country or region. Secondly, um, we had some advice and a lot of care was put into the choice of the colours to ensure that they would be 
suitable for people with colour blindness, in, in particular red-green colour blindness, which is the most common variant. So the, each of the colours has been designed so that as they sit next to each other, they're easily um, easy to distinguish. We've also chosen colours where you just need a single name for them. So grey, pink, yellow, green, for example. There's, there's no real variation there either. You'll also notice that we have a new level. Um, so above unmodified regular, but below level one mildly thick. And that is the, the level of slightly thick, which is the one that I mentioned that clinicians, um, pedi especially paediatric clinicians mentioned as being needed because it needs to be a thickened liquid that will flow through an infant teat. Things that stay the same, and this is really important to note as well, um, are our names. So extremely thick stays the same, moderately thick stays the same, mildly thick stays the same. We have slightly thick as that new level and then thin. I've included the information here about the, um, the ETSI flow test, but we are going to spend um, dedicated time in webinars going through those in more detail coming forward. In terms of the foods, again, you'll notice that we've got an extra level here now. Um, so this is liquidized. So this was something that, again, clinicians indicated that is used around the world. Um, we, we're taking special care with our frequently asked questions to ask people to be very careful how they prepare that liquidized um, food because we're very aware that uh, there are it can be um, there can be real nutritional uh, problems if it isn't prepared with the assistance of, um, of a dietitian and implemented with the assistance of a dietitian. Again, we've got numbers rather than letters. Um, so we continue our numbering system up and we have a new um, texture description here of transitional foods. So this is something that actually spans three different levels and it refers to foods that are what, what you might think of as dissolvable solids. So things like ice cream wafers or potato chips. And again, we'll spend more time talking exactly about transitional foods and what their role is um, in a webinar down the track. Again, things that stay the same. Um, are things like we, we pretty much retain our labels, so things like pureed, our minced and moist, our soft and bite-sized. Um, we, we move from soft to soft and bite-sized and then also across to regular as well. How do we get ready for this change? We've got some um, steps that ITSI's come up with to help with implementation. So the first one is to become familiar with it. Um, ITSI and the easiest way to do that is by visiting the website. Um, I've got a screenshot here of what the, the front page banner looks like and I'd particularly encourage you to look at the framework tab. Um, the translations tab which that might sound an unusual thing to look at but we've actually got translations happening in about 27 different languages at the moment. We're aware that, uh, that there are many staff support staff for example um, who have English as a second language so it may be that you will find um, information in the translation section for your staff that might be of benefit for you. The resources tab and also the frequently asked questions. We've also got a, uh, a contact us tab where people can sign up for newsletters such as the eBite, and also to let you know that we have um, free apps um, available. So Idzi apps that are available both on the um, iOS and also Android platforms. Secondly, form a team. So we want to meet with other team members, form a core Idzi implementation team. We're very much encouraging people to make this um, not just interprofessional, but interprofessional, but really across boundaries. So, including industry, including uh, you know a whole range of people. Thinking about um, people who work on the wards, having it really as wide as possible. Also, making the time to meet with leadership in management to have that support for its implementation, and then developing some plans for awareness and promotion. Spread the word. Um, on under the resources tab, you'll see lots of different. Um, sections and I've included a screenshot here. Each of the little plus marks opens up into a new um, with, with more materials underneath it. So for example in the print and post section you'll find some posters that can be used there to help uh, provide information. 
under the presentation tabs, you'll find a couple of um, PowerPoint presentations, three presentations there that you're welcome to download and use as well. So we've got what is IDSI and why IDSI so that people can deliver those presentations. The webinar recording, so this particular webinar is being recorded and it will be available under the webinar recordings tab. Fourth thing, check out the foods and drinks. So have a look at your current food textures and thickened liquids and compare them to the ITSI detailed descriptors. This is a, a screenshot from um, colleagues in the US who started that process. They simply took all of the drinks that they used, they looked at the, um, the texture that was on the label, they created an Excel spreadsheet and they did some testing and recorded the levels and worked out what stayed the same and what needed some modification. You can find the complete ITSI framework detailed definitions under the framework tab on the website. We want to bring everyone together, the, that implementation core team, work out who's going to do what, who's going to be, um, who's going to participate and in what way. So developing those plans and making sure that you've got a list that you can check off if you're a list person. Meeting regularly, um, reporting obviously, coordinating your efforts. If we look specifically at our foods and drinks, here's a, a, one idea is to host an easy eating and drinking party, which um, is not quite as crazy as it sounds. Um, it, it's a, a unique and, and fun way to introduce it, so it could be used as part of an in-service, for example. We have got um, audit or um, audit tools that are available on the EDSI website for both foods and drinks, and you can work out then the location that you're going to do your testing, how frequently you want to do it, and the timing for your testing as well. Even though we've got three time points noted on the um, on the audit tool, that's really up to you. This is it's it's a suggestion more than anything else. So who gets what? We want to have a um, a review of the assessment process in relation to the the textures and the thickness. So starting at one end of the continuum, which you know may be in the kitchen and working our way all the way through to the wards, for example. So sharing our findings with everyone: people who prescribe, people who order, people who prepare the food, who assemble it, who deliver it as well. We've had some wonderful feedback from um, some of the hospitals that have implemented in the United States, where because their education was so um, inclusive and thorough. They had one of their um, one of the ladies who um, delivers um, tea and you know uh, the the mid meal snacks was able to pick up a mistake in the order and bring it to the attention of a clinician and have it um, amended in order for the patient to have um, have safety there. So we want to pull it all together. So again, just bringing that action list back together again, testing all the systems, making sure that it's all going to work and then looking to launch, making sure that everyone's aware when it's going to happen. So in Australia, we're looking at the 1st of May, 2019. I also wanted to share with you that we've got some implementation guides. So they are under the resources tab in the implementation section. And we've got a few different resources guides there that again, you're welcome to download and, and to use. Um, they are a suggestion, but it's sort of like the 12 months to go um, where there are concepts of, you know, the, here it's a Gantt chart that gives you information on what you should be looking to, you know, to do whether it's signing up for, for eBytes or reviewing different resources, for example. So there is a master guide that includes um, the food service and catering groups, industry and the clinicians and healthcare professionals all on the one master guide. But we also have what those that are just specific to clinicians and healthcare professionals, just specific to food service and catering and just specific to industry. So all of those resources you can see the tab there can be downloaded. What about some of the risks associated with implementation? So um, the steering committee is keeping a register of the risks and we're looking to see how we're going to manage them and who's going to manage them. So the colour green, that change um, for us transitioning across um, to where it will become the, the level four colour. Um, we are looking at things like transition labels, we're educating um, stakeholders and looking to training for food service staff in particular. And we're all responsible for that training. Um, the label changes, we, I've got a, another slide to look at that shortly, but again, industry, steering committee, individual facilities, clinicians, food service and catering staff, looking at awareness in general, 
we've got um, communication plans and stakeholder lists we're developing. I am in the process of developing education material um, and providing that material across a range of platforms and this webinar is one of those platforms. And then information about the changeover period again occurs with um, presentations such as this one and also uh, conference presentations as well. And then tender documents. Um, these will be managed by each of the individual service facilities and may include clauses for a changeover to the 1st of May, for example, in 2019. One of the, um, the questions or the risks in regard to that move, the change from having our mildly thick move um, its colour through to, um, to extremely thick has been the concern that people have raised about aspiration. Um, I wanted to, to just very quickly share with you as well some information about aspiration to clear up clear that up. So dysphagia is considered a risk factor for aspiration pneumonia, but it's not sufficient to cause pneumonia unless there are other risk factors present as well. So there are a whole heap of other things that will determine whether or not someone develops a pneumonia. Things um, that include the aspiration of, of bacteria that's problematic for the person. And those sorts of things really depend on their oral care, the number of de decayed teeth and whether they need someone to help them with feeding and also their immune system as well. So this is a, a model that we use in the, the dysphagia field that shows how those changes will happen. So it's not simply a case of getting the wrong drink where someone is suddenly going to end up um, with an pneumonia. There are lots of other things at play as well. It is important to make sure we have people get the right drinks, um, but just to, to assure you that there are um, other things at play there as well. In terms of our risk management then with a the change in the prepackaged labels, um, it's important that we recognise that it takes industry time to do that, that um, many of the labels that they use uh, are produced in bulk so it takes a little time for them to run out as well and there's a cost obviously to industry that we're sensitive to as well. So for other legislated label change initiatives, so for things like inclusion of um, allergens or country of origin information, um, a two year changeover period is, is most common. Um, we've been working with industry now for at least um, for more than 12 months now and many of the manufacturers have indicated that they will be changing their labels in order to be ready for the 1st of May 2019. These label changes are voluntary um, but that's in the same way that packaging accessibility changes to meet the arthritis guidelines are voluntary as well. We're looking at it from a safety point of view. Um, and we know that industry is on board with us. Manufacturers and industry would like you to contact them directly for information about when their product labels will change. Here's a little bit more information also from that 2017 recommendation for prevention of injury related deaths in aged care as well. Um, and that is the, the concept of having a standardised communication and checking system so that all staff are involved in, um, who are involved in preparation, serving, feeding and supervision of residents at, at meal times are aware of that person's choking risks um, in order to be able to, um, to give people the correct foods and drinks it could be similar to um, what's used in medication where you might have a food chain, for example. So making sure that there are checking systems in place prior to um, residents or even patients in hospital receiving foods or drinks. ITSI's also trying to help you there by, um, we've uh, developed some um, JPEGs uh, that can be included onto stickers. You can download those, so things like this, um, this statement here, this will soon be called moderately thick. You'll be able to stick those directly onto um, pre-prepared drinks or even onto your own um, hospital prepared or, or facility prepared foods and liquids. Just a reminder again that there is that free app um, from both the iOS and Android platforms. Once you've downloaded the app, all of the information is stored on it, so you don't need continued Wi-Fi or data to access the information on it. I found that particularly helpful um, when I've been talking to people um, to give them an idea of, of um, what it is. It includes the videos as well on there as well. I wanted to also just take this opportunity to let you know that um, that ITSI responds, uh, you know, at, at, um, we, we work pretty much 
um, around the, the clock, it feels like, um, and internationally. But we've received a, um, a number of emails as people have come to operationalise the framework uh, where they've asked, how do we order food that's soft but not necessarily bite-sized? Um, so in order to address that, we have developed a very short survey. Um, and I would encourage you to, um, to link into that survey and let us know your opinions there. That survey will be open until the 31st of July. Please feel free to, um, to spread it as widely as possible. Um, when I checked this morning, we've already had over 500 responses um, and we are hearing very clearly that people do feel that there is a, a need to, um, to, to have some way of, of um, ordering soft food that's not necessarily bite-sized. I'm going to, um, to go back into the webinar and, and unmute people now and, um, and allow you to ask questions. If there are questions that you think of later on or if there is um, follow-up information that you need, I'd encourage you to contact me please at that email, australia at idbsi.org. So, Hi Julie. Yeah, Richard Loveday from Flavour Creations. I was just wondering, is there any supporting evidence that we've um, uncovered from overseas countries from when they adopted INSEE and how that has improved uh, patient safety? Um, that's a great question, thank you. Um, so the, what we have at the moment is anecdotal information. It takes a, a little while. We have got one of our um, board members has an NH, um, NIH grant, National Institute of Health grant that is ongoing at the moment. It's a five year grant. Um, and she has just started, Katrina Steele that is, has just started to publish some information about healthy individuals um, that relates to the IDSI framework. The anecdotal information that we have from um, hospitals who've implemented in the US um, are that they are thrilled. So particularly with the IDSI flow test, they've been able to use that in video fluoroscopy to fine tune exactly what level of thickness the, um, the individual needs. And we had um, a father who was a, a doctor whose child required that, who said that his sense of absolute relief in knowing that um, he was able to prepare it um, correctly at home was, uh, was enormous, that he's not previously been able to do that. So it's that kind of feedback that we're getting at the moment. I know as a, as a journal reviewer, I'm starting to see uh, material coming through the journal publications and I expect you to be seeing a lot of information very soon in published literature. Yeah, I think that's pretty important to get that information because obviously this isn't something that's mandated in Australia. So if we had more of that information, I think it'd be an easy discussion to get more engagement, I guess, across the market. Certainly. Um, the other piece of information to share with you from our um, mechanical engineers is that the, um, the error rate, if you like, of the, the ITSI flow test um, is less than, is about 4% and that that is identical to the um, the ARIES rheometer and in some cases the ARIES rheometer is actually at 5%. So it's a, it's quite a, despite the, the fact that it looks a very simple tool, it's quite a reliable tool. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Are there other questions or comments? So you can unmute yourself um, just down the at the bottom of the screen there where the little microphone is. Troy, have you got any questions or comments? Um, the comment I was going, well, uh, the question that I, well, the statement I'll probably make is that um, I work for an organisation, Queensland Health, um, and Queensland Health are going through their own processes of determining how and um, when ITSI will be implemented. So I suppose from um, each different um, person's perspective, or, or depending, I suppose, which jurisdiction they work in, which organisation they work for, it will be something that your organisation, um, if you're a key person there, you will need to engage and start those discussions, um, given that you may, you, you will see some product changing after the 1st of May. Um, it doesn't mean to say that um, you will see all product changing after then and you're 
your facility or your jurisdiction may choose not to implement it at that given point in time, but then that's something you're going to have to work through, I would imagine, if the products that you're buying start to have the new labels and the new colour coding on it. So there's probably a raft of things that um, you may think of afterwards um, in having said you might choose not to implement how you would then manage um, with the colour changes that may come. So the whole plan for these webinars was Julie was giving an introduction this afternoon um, to all of our IHHC members and also to anybody external who wishes to join in. Um, the next four webinars, so there'll be one in um, August, September, October and November, those dates I've arranged with Julie now. I've purposely not um, put up registration for those on the IHHC webpage yet. I just didn't want people to get too confused. So after, it will probably be late towards the end of this week, registration for the next workshop will come up. And before we finish, I'll just get Julie to run through the titles of the next series of workshops that we're going to be doing with you guys. Um, we'll have a break over Christmas and by the time we get to the November webinar, we may have um, a bank of questions, we may have some scenarios that we um, may be able to all pool our resources together and work out some resources or give some ideas to Julie um, as the project officer with the Australian ITSI Steering Committee on what resources they might need to develop for us as well. Um, I've particularly um, been passionate that, um, and I know the IHHC board have been um, very supportive of this, that we represent food service staff and operational services staff um, that will be handing a lot of these drinks, foods, where this impact will, um, where this change will impact a lot of you guys, or all of you guys. So that's why we want to get the information out there. Um, so, and then at the end of the year, if there's, um, if there's a situation where we need to have some more webinars at the beginning of next year and help individual organisations um, just do it as a blanket, um, you know, as a blanket statement that this is something you should start to work on or develop or this is your implementation plan. Um, Julie and I have spoken about those and, and we will hopefully, if we need to, we will be able to assist you with those um, from a generic point of view and then you would manipulate it and change it to your organisation or jurisdiction. So, um, I did, I think there was a question from, um, and I, I did see her online. Wendy Lewis, are you online? You did ask a question um, by email, but I can't remember it off the top of my head at the moment. Are you still there, Wendy? I think it was about the time frame for implementation, and I know Julie has spoken about that. It is, implementation is the 1st of May next year, is it? That's right. Yeah, it's, a, it's the 1st of May. Now, we, we recognise, well, in an ideal world, everyone would switch over at the same time. Um, we recognise that, uh, you know, some places may be, you know, a little in advance. Some people may be a little bit behind. You, you know, you've really got to work with within your workplace and um, make sure that everyone's moving at a safe rate um, together towards that common goal. So I know Julie is presenting at the IHHC National Conference, that's correct. Is it Julie? Thank yep. You. So Julie will be in Sydney in October, um, undertaking a presentation there. Um, and as I said, we have another four webinars before the end of the year. So this was an introduction. Um, the next four webinars, Julie, what, are, what subjects are they on? So the um, webinar two, um, we've called IDSI flow test and liquid levels 0 to 3. So I'll go through in um, some detail the, um, the detailed descriptors of each of those types of liquids. Now they can be used to assess things like not just drinks in fact, but sauces, gravies and liquid medications as well. Um, so I'll go through all of those. I'll, I may move my computer out to the kitchen and see if I can even do some flow testing online as well. Um, 
Webinar three, the one scheduled in September, will look at the Idzi fork drip test and the spoon tilt tests. So to go through both of those, again, looking at the detailed descriptors and um, some of the um, brainstorming uh, potential plating and delivery challenges um, that might happen there. Webinar four in October is the Idzi fork pressure test and particle size tests. Um, so what are they and why are they used? Um, again, with some information about you know, choking risk, a special focus on level five, um, minced and moist and recipe sharing ideas. And then webinar five in November, the IDSI fork pressure test for specifically for level six, soft and bite sized. Um, so to look at, at that, by that stage, we'll also have some information about the, the soft with no particle size restrictions as well. Um, and also look to brainstorm um, whether we need some more webinar topics for 2019 in order in the lead up to implementation on the 1st of May in 2019. Excellent. So look, Julie, thank you so much for your time. Um, myself on behalf of the Queensland Committee and the National Board, thank you. I know John's online and I see um, Mr. Mary Lee Stewart is online as well. I'm not certain if any of the, uh, and Lisa Cranham is online, so another board member. I haven't seen that Carrie's online from um, Western Australia, but he may be online. So on behalf of the National Board, thank you, and the Queensland Committee and all the other state committees. We look forward to everybody joining in next time. Um, the series of workshops will be free to any IHHC members. If you have counterparts that would like to join in, there will be a small registration fee of $20 to gain the dial-in details down the track. Um, so those registrations will go up for the next webinar towards the end of next week or early next week. Um, the date off my head, I'm not 100% certain. Julie, do you have that? I know it's basically a month from today. I think I have it on double check, but I have it as the 7th, 7th of August. August. Yep. Yeah, no, so at, again at 1.30. Yeah, so 1.30 um, Queensland, New South Wales, Vic and Taz time and then um, South Australia, obviously a little bit different. And I know we have international um, guests here today, so um, I know that there's um, an attendee from Hong Kong and from New Zealand as well. So really appreciate it. If you do have questions down the track, as Julie said, email them to that, um, that email address. So it's australia at iddsi.org or email myself directly on that ihhcqld at gmail.com um, email address. It's all over the invitations and I'll shoot them to Julie and we can get an answer back to you. I'll discuss with Julie about this presentation, whether we can get it in a smaller format and then get it published on the um, IHHC webpage. Um, but there will be information coming out. And please, if you found this interesting, join us for the next webinar. This change will be coming from the 1st of May. So the least we can do is educate everybody the best we can. Um, so you are armed with the information that if the change affects you and your workplace, um, or the organisation you work for, you're knowledgeable about what will happen and how you can manage it um, to implement it in your area. So thank you. Thank okay. you, Julie. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks.